and welcome to the Prigya Arora show where we discuss aspects of law, IP and entrepreneurship with people who have been there and done that. My name is Prigya Arora and our guest for today is Elliot Alderman. Uh, welcome Elliot on the show. He's an excellent person who deals with this niche field of sports and IP and, and admire it for his work. Welcome Elliot on the show. Hi, Pridya. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much. So Elliot, let's start start with our, uh, with our fun and interesting warm-up question. What is one thing in life you cannot live without? Sleep. <laughs> Sleep and exercise. Wow, awesome. I haven't heard this answer from anyone <laughs> yet. And these are so, so important aspects of our life. So, yeah. So, Elliot, can you share your life story and how did you become the person you are today? That, that, that's a very complicated question, I guess, one step at a time. Um, in, in terms of being an IP lawyer, I, I think my my glib answer is that I needed a class at 7.30 on a Tuesday night. The probably more honest answer is that I've, I've always liked uh, content. I've been a big reader and I like music and film and um, it seemed like a, a logical fit when I took the class that I didn't really like wills and contracts and all the other things that you get in the first year. And this was, I think, in my, my second year. So everything kind of came together for me. And it, it's something that, like I said, I've always been interested and in. it's, it's very satisfying for me because with technology, it's always changing. So um, there's nuances and wrinkles and it, it seems like a, a new puzzle each time you look at it. Yeah, Elliot, you work with sports teams and creatives and that has been your niche. So was there any, uh, like, was it uh, motivated by your personal interest or was it just a professional interest? I think, like, is there any story behind why did you choose this niche? <laughs> I, I, I think probably it's both. Um, I've always liked sports too and I... I, I work with a telecom lawyer. We have a consulting venture which deals with venues. So um, I started doing work with an NBA team and there was a way that sports and entertainment, I think are two sides of the same coin. Yeah. And I had never really thought about it that way. And what a lot of the teams are doing is the broadcast Yes, rights are, are pooled and they're negotiated at the local level. So anything involving the venue is the venue is where they perform. And the issues are kind of generalizable, whether it's a smart campus, a casino, an amusement park, they all have similar issues. So what they're trying to do is to get people there who are not hardcore fans, because I think hardcore fans tend to be, um, they, they have a real strong draw to be there and they're willing to tolerate a lot that someone who isn't a hardcore fan is. So my story for that is that I had a friend who had uh, Redskins tickets, that's when they were called the Redskins, and they were on the 50 yard line and I think if you were a hardcore football fan, they would have been extraordinary. I'm not. So it was freezing. <laughs> I'm so used to the technology of showing where the line of scrimmage is. So someone would be running and running and running. And I never knew whether they'd even broken the line of scrimmage because I'm so used to watching it on TV. So going back to the venue, um, for fans that aren't hardcore, you want to have as pleasant an experience as possible. So yeah. you want an arena that's not a labyrinth. You want, um, like I worked with this team on a mobile app, which had things like wayfinding, which gets you around the venue and makes it easy. You want to be able to order food and merchandise. 
And I think that teams are going more towards technology because it's a seamless process. Yeah. So if you go back to the local, one of the really big issues is selling merchandise. So if you can go onto your mobile app, make an order, use Apple Pay or some other means of payment, and the merchandise can be delivered to your house, that's a much more pleasant experience than being jostled, walking to some little place where you know people are banging into each other. And you know, like, like the classic story I think is in the arena, because I used to go to these games, um, you would have this little booth and there'd be five or 10 employees literally banging into each other because they couldn't get to the cash register. So things like that, technology solves that problem. And I think that's a problem, particularly during COVID with touchless e-commerce where you can get in for ticketing, you can order things without touching other people. So I think that that's a trend in, in sports and, and in venues generally. Well, great, Elliot. And I think we discussed the intersection of technology and sports very well, how they both interact with each other. There are so many aspects, as you just told, that uh, people who, who are not well-versed with the sport, sometimes it becomes difficult for them to experience what is happening. And then technology comes to the rescue to probably aware them more. So uh, we discussed the aspect of intersection of technology and sports. Can you tell us something more about intersection of IP and sports? Where, where, where is that intersection? What happens when, when a case comes to you? Or how do you uh, look at from the perspective of intellectual property and intersection of sports while, while you address your clients? I, I think probably the typical macro is that uh, the broadcast of any sports is protected by copyright. Yeah. And, and merchandise um, triggers trademark or use of the trademarks of the teams. Um, for me, mostly it's the integration of simpler ways to do things in the infrastructure. So they, they all have um, arenas, venues, and any entertainment or sports facility has a very complicated technical infrastructure. So the fan facing part makes it easier. That's what we were talking about before. It makes it easier for consumers of sports to enjoy it. The back end is the functioning of the venue. And the idea is that when you integrate something, um, to benefit, say, fans, it doesn't blow out the back end and, you know, you're sitting in the arena with no lights and no air conditioning. So mm -hmm. it, it has to seamlessly work so that it works internally and it also works externally. Yeah. So, uh, Elliot, uh, there are issues of copyright, trademarks, sports, technology, and intermingling of so many things. So a personal question, like, was it very easy to aware people that you should look into the aspects of IP in sports or you should protect or put in the right strategy? Was it easy for you or you will have or you at that point of time when you started with this career, a lot of knowledge and awareness was required from at your part? I think for um, very sophisticated consumers, it wasn't. Like I was lucky that this um, NBA team was very, very technically sophisticated. Mm -hmm. I, I think for a lot of sports though, that isn't the case. And issues are usually handled at the league level. And I think for a lot of sports, they're kicking the can down the road um, this this team was very, very forward um, perceiving, and they they were trying to um, save money and also make more money. So, so they were trying to have a, a more efficient platform to deliver content and services. So I think probably 
It's a hard question to answer. I, I would say probably most venues are not that sophisticated. Yeah. They they do what they have to do. And they're they're not really thinking long term that an investment of time and money is is going to help them in the in the long run. Yeah. They're more thinking about money going out and not not the bigger picture. And technology makes it hard because you don't really know where, where technology is going to be. So you have to be in the position where you're thinking of a broader landscape. And I, I don't think a lot of uh, consumers of services do that. Yeah, I, I agree with you so much, like especially venues. I can't I can't imagine that going into the sports venue, uh, we can probably educate people and make them our clients. <laughs> So I think there, there, there must be so, so many other opportunities like going somewhere and think, oh my God, IP is everywhere. <laughs> so we can just club something and make a niche and help people and we'll probably grow our business. Yeah. <laughs> I, well, I, I think COVID was, was a, a good generator of means to address that because you, you've, you've forced sports teams and venues to adapt to different ways to perform. So you could always have broadcasting because that didn't implicate, you know, people face-to-face -face in germs. But there's, I think there's a way that um, people want to go to a sporting event. Yeah. Like there's something transcendent about live sports. And if you're really, really a hardcore fan, it's not a substitute to be watching it on TV. So the idea is that you want to get as many consumers as possible, and you want to expand beyond hardcore fans to make people interested and then make the experience not terribly unpleasant. Yeah. So, so like going back to the football game, in addition to it being freezing, and not really knowing what was going on because I was so used to technology, you have to wait two hours to get out of the parking lot. So I, I think for the, I think for this group of fans, which is probably most of them, you have to make that experience really, really pleasant. Or TV is a substitute, or or streaming is a substitute. Yeah, absolutely. So, Elliot, just as uh, you explored sports venue and IP and you came up with the intersection of that, can, can you think of something else or probably an area where IP is still unexplored and probably if you have something in mind? I think um, technology generally, maybe specifically NFTs now, are, are an yeah. area where... Um, you're kind of stretching the bounds of intellectual property. I think people, consumers don't really know what they're getting. Yeah. And I, I think that there's a way that it's like a feedback loop for crypto. Mm -hmm. So people who are comfortable with digital currency are okay with the idea of, you know, buying something that's not a material object and having authenticity proven on the blockchain. But I, I think a lot of people don't really understand that um, you need intellectual property rights to be able to mint an NFT. And, and, and I think a lot of people, when they're purchasing it, they, they, they probably understand that it's this digital thing unless it's coupled with a material object. Yeah. But they're not really sure the rights they're getting. And it's often the case that the mentor doesn't have intellectual property rights. So that, that's a real wild, wild west, I think now. And I think, yeah, and it is, it is a, you know, gray area. Why? Because sometimes when people are purchasing NFTs, they don't know, is it, will the copyright remain with the owner? Will the copyright remain with the photographer? Will the copyright remain with, will come to us? Where, where will the intellectual property go? So I think that is really, really dicey. I think typically when you're purchasing an NFT, mm -hmm. you're not getting IP rights. Like there is a way that, you know, for example, with Bored Apes, if you're getting some kind of IP rights, then maybe there's a model for 
each ape being distinctive enough that you could create derivative works where you have a, um, you can use them as a source indicator for trademark because they're distinguished from others. You Maybe you can write a book or have a movie or something like that. But I think typically when you're getting an NFT, it's the same way that if you get a material object that's a piece of art, you own the material object, but you don't own the, the intellectual property. Yeah, absolutely. So now, Elliot, uh, coming to your life, like now we'll discuss some aspect of aspects of your life. What is your favorite part of being in this industry? What do you enjoy the most? <laughs> I, I, I guess I, I've been doing it forever. And I, I can say that it's been 40 years now. Yeah. And I, I've always, like I said, I've always liked content. And I, I find it interesting because technology is always an aspect of it. So it's always changing. And you're always kind of adapting to that. There is, it's very subjective, which is kind of unnerving sometimes because mm -hmm. clients want certainty and you can't give them certainty. Yes. But conversely, I, I think it makes it intellectually stimulating because it's not like, I mean, I imagine if you've written 10,000 wills that after <laughs> a while, like it's pretty boring and you probably know it really well, but it's like with, with copyright or trademark, you're walking out on ice and you never really know if the ice is going to hold you. <laughs> so I, I think that that makes it pretty stimulating. I think that this is so true. You know, uh, sometimes a client, uh, I also specifically practice in patent. So whenever client, so specifically when we have software cases and computer programs, we are like, mm -hmm. we can't give you a guarantee whether you will get a yeah. patent or not. Only the chances are high if we draft it mm -hmm. in this manner, but uh, yeah. we can't give you any surety. And then the client would be like, we need certainty. Should we invest or we shouldn't invest? So we, we say, okay, now we have 70% chances, but 30% yeah. chances are still yeah. there that you may yeah. not get. <laughs> so it is this kind of, and this is possible because technology is ever growing and law is just you know trying to just reach out close to the technology but uh, the technology is ever growing so this 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 happens and it it sometimes become very difficult to get this straight in front of the clients yeah i, I think that's right the best that you can do is to analogize yeah and often someone else like a judge may not agree with your analogy. So mm -hmm. you, you're trying to say that um, this technology is like that. So if you're exploiting it in this way, it's likely that these rights are implicated and or that you, you're gonna have the right or not the right, you know, the right not, not to uh, not be able to use it. Correct, absolutely. So now Elliot will do our quick rapid fire round which is a three to one rapid fire round three things you are grateful for can i use sleep and exercise again <laughs> <laughs> I, i'm grateful for for animals too we have a, a bunch of of pets and i i think they make they make life a lot richer wow sleep exercise and animals <laughs> Two trades that you think are useful for a legal career? I think the the ability to analyze, to listen, and I would almost repeat listen because I, I know that I hired lawyers. I was a general counsel of a company for a decade. Yeah. And it's I've so I've been a client plus an outside lawyer. And I think the ability to listen is really important. And I, I don't think you can overemphasize that, that when, when you're thinking about telling me how smart you are and whatever's going on in your head, you're not listening to the question that, that I'm asking. Okay. And I, I could always tell when I was hiring lawyers, and I think that's a skill that I, I try and exercise myself, that you know the client may not always be right, but I want to hear what they're saying and I want to hear the questions that they're asking rather than 
my own agenda. Yeah, absolutely. Analyzing and listening, such very important skills. And uh, one aspiration you have for the future? Uh, world peace. <laughs> uh, that that the earth is not going to melt. I, I, I was I was watching. I, we were talking before about the news and how I'm trying to avoid watching the news. Yeah. I, I saw I saw footage of a street. I think it was in London that was buckling or melting from the heat, and that's pretty terrifying. And, yeah. and so I guess what I aspire to is that the earth doesn't melt and that we have world peace because. <laughs> It'd be nice to be able to coexist and have the planet around for a while. <laughs> yeah, even I pray for that. <laughs> so, Elliot, uh, can you share some key takeaways take for young lawyers and entrepreneurs who want to get into uh, this field or explore law or entrepreneurship? Yeah, I, I would say that listening again is, is, is very important. And I, I think it's also really important to do something that you like yeah because I when I was in college I took intro to everything because I didn't know what I wanted to do and they kind of require you to do that in law school where you have fixed classes for the first year and then maybe there are some in the second too I think it's really important that if you're going to be working for decades that there's something that it, you have a passion about and when I first started doing this, it was last century. It was at the, the dawn of the internet. And I don't know that people realized how the internet was gonna revolutionize things. I, I think there was a way that um, I analogize NFTs, I think, to the dot-com. And I'm not sure that they're gonna be a bubble, but there was something with yeah. the internet where, you know, the idea was that what you have to do, I think, with intellectual property is create something that's desirable. Mm -hmm. um, by the fact that it's a dot com doesn't create a business in the same way that, um, for example, with NFTs, I have a lot of clients who are visual artists. And for them, if there is a, a use for their work, if there's a desire for their visual art, then an NFT is a great medium. But it's not like you know, you're taking a picture of a leaf in your backyard and making an NFT out of it. It doesn't necessarily create interest in that unless you're some celebrity or something or a famous yeah. artist. And then we're not going to get into the subjective value of art. But I, I think that that's, that's the way that it works. And um, I think it's really important that you have something that you can feel passionate about because law is pretty stressful mm -hmm. in a lot of ways. I think it's boring, although I don't think what we do is boring. And I think that's a gift because I'm not sure that somebody doing their 10,000th will feels <laughs> that what they do is really stimulating and, yeah. you know, not to beat up on the state lawyers, but, uh, yeah, absolutely. So find your passion, do something which is exciting to you. If it's not exciting, I think after a while it will get boring. So find something that excites you. <laughs> yeah, and, and it, it's interesting because when I first started, the, the intellectual property, I think, was was not ubiquitous the way it is now. I think that there were traditional industries. So yeah. in the United States, in New York and California, you had movies and you had um, sound recordings, you had publishing, but distribution platforms like the internet have really rev revolutionized intellectual property. And so now you can do it anywhere and the issues are all over the place. So I think it's really fundamentally changed. And, I guess for me, it was a leap of faith because there really wasn't a lot of IP work when I first started because I was in DC and I didn't really want to go to New York or California. So that was a leap of faith that the work would come to me. Yeah, absolutely. And 40 years in this career, I think that at that point, it might have just started and people were unsure. We, we didn't know what laws will come up. And I yeah, think we all yeah. gradually came up later on. 
Yeah, I think that's right. Yeah. So you you have seen all the growth of whatever law we study. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I guess I'd like to think that you don't have the same uncertainty that you did then because there's more precedent. But I think there is a way that yeah. um, technology has changed so much. I don't know that they're going to be more than I don't know if they're going to be fundamental technical changes now. Maybe they are incremental, so maybe that means that there is enough precedent that there's slight tweaks as opposed to something which is a sea change, but maybe there's something in the future which is a technology that we're not anticipating, and everything is going to be upended. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, we, we all don't know that what is the future going to be. It's, it's too yeah. uncertain yeah. to yeah. <laughs> just figure out. And law will just come behind it. Law can never be, you know. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, like it cannot be uh, in front of the technology. It is always backward. It's just yeah. catching up, catching yeah. up, catching up kind yeah. of thing the law does. Yeah, I, I think definitionally that's true because the whole idea of law is is that you have like a finite known universe that you're addressing. And when you're anticipating technology, it just makes it really dangerous because you don't know what technology is going to do. So what law can do is to look at what the technical landscape is and then make adjustments case by case because Otherwise, you're anticipating things that you, there's no way that you can really know. Correct, absolutely. So, Elliot, it was a wonderful discussion, intersection of sports and IP, and this is your domain. You are the master of it. Thank you so much <laughs> for your Thank time. Thank you for having me. Yeah, thanks for having me. Thank you so much for your time and willingness to share. Thank you. Okay. Hey there, thank you for attending today's session. If you enjoyed today's session, do follow our channel and consider sharing it with a friend. My name is Prigya Arora, daughter of inspiring parents, alumna of IIT Khadakpur, engineer turned lawyer and entrepreneur and now founder of PA Legal where we help creators and innovators protect their intellectual property. Thank you.